from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Coming up on Ag Day. The wool was flying and the music was loud. How the world's knitting and metal combined. Is the corn crop finally getting some help from Mother Nature? I thought 15 was bad, but I think this has got it considerably beat. And why some analysts feel we could possibly see a deal with China sooner rather than later. I think the ball's in the Chinese court right now. Ag Day, presented by the all-new Chevy Silverado, the strongest, most advanced Silverado ever. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. China firing back after President Trump accused it last week of not promptly buying more U.S. ag products. A Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson saying the ag trade issue should be addressed by the two sides together, quote, on the basis of equality and mutual respect, end quote. It's in response to President Trump tweeting out, quote, they have not been buying the agricultural products from our great farmers that they said they would. Hopefully they will start soon. And some optimism coming out of China about the two sides reaching a possible trade deal. A Chinese Commerce Ministry spokesman saying the trade issues plaguing relations between the two countries were kick-started back up by the Trump G meeting at the G20 in Japan late last month and adding, quote, we will definitely be able to find solutions to the problems, end quote. The White House advisor Peter Navarro said on Friday in-person talks would start soon, saying U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin will travel to Beijing in the very near future. Dan Bossi with Ag Resource joining us from Chicago. Dan, negotiators back at the table. What's the chance of getting an agreement in the next few months? Well, the two presidents, President Xi of China and, of course, President Trump of the United States, both have a will to get a package. Uh, we think that that will is deepening on the U.S. side as we get closer to the U.S. election. I don't think the Trump administration wants to carry this uh, trade dispute into the 2020 election cycle, so he's anxious for a deal. And I think we saw some of that in terms of what he gave the, Jap the Chinese in, in the meetings in Osaka, Japan. That being said, there's still some big issues in front of these uh, countries. Uh, we still have the intellectual property rights issue. We still have state supported industries, that issue. And I'm not sure the Chinese are really ready to relent on, on those two issues. So we can maybe make a trade deal if the Trump administration is willing to water down its demands. But if it doesn't, I'm afraid this dispute will have some longevity and may carry into the election. I think the ball's in the Chinese court right now. Uh, we are told that whatever the Chinese decide on this agreement, the old agreement that goes back to May, if they want to approve it, we can move forward. If they don't, uh, we may see the Trump administration within 30 to 60 days ramping up tariffs on more goods and uh, having a heightened trade war. I'm concerned this may get worse before it gets better. All right, thanks, Dan. And new numbers are continuing to show the impact of the trade war between the two countries. China's imports from the U.S. plunging 31.4% in June from a year earlier, while exports to the U.S. sank 7.8%. Now that's according to customs data. As an example, China imported 6.51 million metric tons of soybeans in June. That's a 25.2% slide versus last year and the lowest month since 2014. And the longer the trade war goes on, the more permanent the shift will be in the trade of U.S. ag products. Now, that's according to Cargill's chief financial officer, David Dines. He spoke recently to Bloomberg. Cargill reporting net income fell 67 percent from a year ago in the first three months of this year. It is the steepest profit decline for the company in four years. Dines saying, quote, we are concerned about our farmer customer. It's been a challenging time for farmers here at home, both from a trade aspect, but obviously the weather aspect, end quote. On a different trade front, the German economy minister saying he sees about a 50 percent chance of the EU reaching a trade agreement with the U.S. yet this year. He said he met with U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer last Thursday. The minister saying if the two sides would respect each other's key interests, an agreement could be reached by the end of this year. Talks between the EU and U.S. have stalled recently, with Europe rejecting America's calls to include U.S. ag in a possible deal. The fight over tomatoes continues between the U.S. and Mexico. Now leaders from both countries may meet to discuss a solution. 
Mexico's economy minister, Garciela Marquez, reaching out to U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, and according to Reuters, she's asking for a meeting to solve a disagreement over Mexican tomatoes. Back in May, the administration imposed a 17.5% tariff on Mexican tomatoes after the two countries were unable to renew an agreement that had suspended a U.S. anti-dumping investigation. Marquez is hoping the two sides can find a solution and end those tariffs. USDA will be updating crop progress and crop conditions later this afternoon, and while planning is all wrapped up, farmers say they need a long growing season. Brent Lowry farms in Searsboro, Iowa. He says like much of the Midwest, the planting season was long and drawn out. They planted more in June than they ever have. That's made for a variety of plant maturities, from tasseling corn to corn that's just knee high. And last week, just 1% of Iowa corn was silking. Last year, it was 30%. 7% of soybeans are blooming compared to more than 40% a year ago. Lowry says he's hoping for a long growing season yet. We didn't plant the uh, most ideal conditions. I'm sure our root structure is not great. Um, we're going to need a lot of, lot of time yet. This crop, you know, even where it looks decent, it's, it's just behind. You know, it's two weeks to a month and a half behind in spots. And we're, we're going to need a, a late summer and uh, a nice, nice fall. About 60% of Iowa corn and soybeans are considered good to excellent. Meanwhile, in Missouri, it's a similar story. Crops near Cairo, Missouri are all over the board in terms of maturities. Les Monroe farms and does crop consulting in the area. He says there are still replants and double crop planting underway. They need the warm weather to continue, but not without more rain. The heat units right now are helping, so we're seeing the corn move along and develop. It's starting to get some good color now. Uh, that some areas are it's tossing and it looks pretty good. It's not stressed too much now, but believe it or not, in some areas right now we could use rain. Uh, we're, we're dry in especially north central Missouri around the Trenton area. It's very dry in the Laredo area, uh, but we got pockets that, that are a little bit better shaped than others. Uh, believe it or not, though, we look better right now than I thought we would a month ago. Monroe says there's still potential for a good crop in his area, but weather has to cooperate. It's not just corn that's finally starting to grow, but other crops are blooming, as meteorologist Mike Hoffman shows us in today's Crop Commons. Mike. Thanks, Clinton. While so many of the crops are grown for very practical purposes, sometimes those rows create beautiful flowers, like this flax in Washburn, North Dakota. Ross Peterson sharing this photo with us. Just look at that sea of periwinkle colored flowers for as far as the eye can see. The crop itself looking pretty good as well. I'll have more on your forecast coming up, but first here's some hometown temps. Introducing Farm Journal TV, on demand 24 seven. Ag Day, Machinery Pete TV. US Farm Report on your phone and tablet. Download the Farm Journal TV mobile app today. So what are the markets telling us? It's our job to listen. That's according to a guest coming up in agribusiness and later working with wool has never been so heavy. Heavy metal that is. Why are these rockers knitting on stage? An answer today in the country. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. The market ended Friday with a rally continuing in grains. Can it last into this week? We'll get an update from the CME. Today in the grain market, soybeans jumped up. That hot weather ahead is really pushing the market higher. There's worries that there's potential crop damage, especially from the muddy fields from those uh, showers uh, over the last number of weeks. And uh, if the market turns uh, on its head where we have a hot and dry weather, that really is going to affect uh, 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 all the crops, it, even including the corn. The corn rallied as well. Right now, all eyes are really on the weather, and we're going to watch that closely. Also today in corn, had the big shot in the arm for 104,000 uh, metric tons uh, uh, sent to Panama, which is really new, about four or five times of what they normally have done. That really opened the eyes of a lot of traders. That got the market really starting to roll, so it was really pushing higher. 
uh, wheat was firm as well. It's consolidating after the report yesterday, and it had a big that we had that big surge, that re surprise reduction in the world ending stocks gave the wheat that boost that we were looking for. Today in the livestock complex, live cattle was firm. That strong underlying support is really building, and and in spite of the fact that the grain market was a higher, we were able to still get a couple of upticks in that live cattle. Interestingly enough, that USDA report that came out yesterday was bearish, and yet the market and corn and wheat and soybeans rallied yesterday and continue to rally more today. That's putting some serious pressure on that feeder market and the feeders started to fall. It looks like that we're going to be trading back and forth. The feeders basically gave back all their gains for this week. Sorting through the market noise can be a challenge and frankly a little confusing. Tyne Morgan joins us from our studios in Kansas City with a look at how to listen when the market talks. Here now with Darren Newsom of Darren Newsom Analysis. Darren, you're a big proponent of watch what the market is telling you. Look at signs in the market, look at trends, watch what the market's telling you. So when you look at the market right now, what is it telling us? Right now it's telling us that, the, let's just look at the corn market. Let's start with the corn market. And if we look at the forward curve, the December to July forward curve, uh, series of future spreads, what we see is very little carry out there, particularly with the CME changing its official storage rates from five cents per bushel to, per month to eight cents per bushel per month. What we, the carry that we've got now in that forward curve covers very little full calculated full commercial carry. That's a bullish situation. That's telling me that the commercial side of the market is very concerned about supply and demand down the road. And that's even accounting for the roughly 2.4 billion bushels that is expected to be carried over from 2017-18, from excuse me, 2018-19 into the 19-20 marketing year. So we look at forward curves. It's telling us that corn's bullish, soybeans not so much. There's still a lot of question marks about soybeans. Do we know exactly why commercial traders are this bullish? Do we know if it's acres? Do we know if it's production, whatever? No, and we don't need to know. What we do need to know is right there in front of us, and that is the commercial side's bullish. Let's look at basis, same thing. Soybeans, again, not quite as bullish. Still have a lot of soybeans to deal with, despite the silliness of the 40, uh, 40 million bushel uh, residual use adjustment this, this, past, uh, this past report. So we look at forward curves, we look at basis, then we just simply look at the, uh, the trends of the market itself, and that tells us where the fund, markets, uh, the fund money is going. Market's trending up, funds are pouring money into it. So real quick, what should a producer's end game be? I've heard a lot um, that, you know, they think corn prices are going higher. They've positioned themselves as such. And then when we see a little retracement and we see this, the, you know, kind of the, the, the barriers that corn prices have, they're getting frustrated. But, you know, looking all year, what should their end game be? End game should be just simply rule number one is uh, don't get crossways with the trend. So as long as the market's trending up, stay in step with that. It's when it starts to change. Right now we're not seeing it, but when it starts to change, when we start to see the carry strength and whatever it might be, then we might need to make a move. All right, Darren, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. We need to take a quick break and then we'll be back with much more right here on Ag Day. The IBM Watson Decision Platform for Agriculture, helping to feed a hungry world with the power of AI. Welcome back to Ag Day, your meteorologist Mike Hoffman looking at the root zone moisture map. And Mike, you can see it had started to dry out along the Gulf Coast there, but probably not going to be an issue after this week. Yeah, next week, or at least the middle of this coming week, we'll probably see that change to blue in southern Louisiana. I don't think there's any question after Barry. And also, once we uh, get the new root zone moisture in the middle of this week, there will probably be a little less blue through the middle of the country. As we see things continuing to heat up and dry out in many areas, and that is going to be uh, perhaps a concern as we head down the road. As far as the drought monitor is concerned, not a huge concern in most places, but a few spots in the southeast, far north, uh, northern North Dakota, western New Mexico, and the far northwest. There's a few areas with some drought, but uh, overall not a big issue. Now, as far as rainfall last week, the estimated amounts, uh, uh, this goes from a week ago Saturday through midday this past Friday. So that does not include Barry. This is gonna be uh, showing up next week's on the chart. But even before that, you can see there were a fair amount, uh, there was a fair amount of rain, parts of southeastern Louisiana, but also Florida. Lots of afternoon thunderstorms uh, were creating some pretty decent amounts. And you can see the mid-Atlantic, especially Washington, D.C. area, where we, we had the flooding into southeastern Pennsylvania. 
Uh, much of the country didn't see a lot of rain, but then there was this other pocket of intense thunderstorms near Kearney and southwestward toward McCook, with some areas getting 8 to 10 inches of rain there. Here's the jet stream. Well, we're definitely going to go zonal for a little while as we head through this week, but as we head through the end of the week, next weekend, look at the ridge that pops back up, and that's going to bring the heat back for most of the middle of the country. Uh, not going to be a lot of cool air around by the end of this week, so temperatures this week, I'm going above normal in most areas, except Louisiana toward Florida, Montana, and then below normal, as you can see, along the west coast. And that's about it. Lots of heat this coming week. Precipitation above normal in the track of Barry. That may shift a little bit depending on exactly where the remnants of Barry goes. Other than that, below normal for most of the plains, below normal for most of the western states except the far northwest near normal there. 30 day outlook for temperatures. I'm going above normal for the Great Lakes, northeast. Mid-Atlantic down into the southeastern states, Gulf Coast, southern Texas, and in the western third of the country. Below normal only for the uh, west central portions of the uh, Plain states. Above normal then from the northern Rockies to the central plains southward to Louisiana. Below normal in the uh, east and the far southwest. That's a look across the country. Now let's take a look at some local forecasts. Heading to Lewistown, Montana, first of all, comfortable, a good deal of sunshine today, high of 77. Oklahoma City, lots of sunshine, hot and humid, the high up to 93. And Macon, Georgia, muggy with a mix of sun and clouds, high around 92. Rocking and knitting sounds peaceful, right? But not for a group that gathered recently overseas, you just have to see this. Coming up, plus Machinery Pete is here. Talking hot prices on used track tractors coming up, folks. Stay tuned. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. There could soon be a new way to spray crops from above in the form of drones. A company called Rantizo says it's received approval from the Federal Aviation Administration to spray crops using a drone. The ag tech startup is based in Iowa City, Iowa. It's the first company in the state to get this approval. And according to the company, the first approved applications were for a corn fungicide and spreading cover crop seeds. Wet fields means there's a demand right now for track tractors. Machinery Pete looks into this hot market and has some advice. Well, not surprising, I suppose, given the very late and wet harvest 18 and plant 19 seasons we've had, folks, that we're seeing a big increase in the demand for and prices paid for good used track tractors. Now, back on a farm auction May 30th up in northwest Minnesota, this Challenger 65E with 1,900 hours on it sold for $72,000. And when I got checking our auction price data at machinerypeat.com, well, that's the highest auction price on a 65E in 20 years. Now, just last Thursday, a farm auction in Northeast Illinois, a couple more hot prices on Challengers. Here's a picture of a 2011 MT755C. This thing had 3,684 hours on it, sold for $108,000. Now, that's the highest auction price on an MT755C in four and a half years. Now, on the same sale, this older 04 MT855, 3,996 hours on it, went for $97,000. And when we looked at our auction archive here, we find that's the highest price in three and a half years on an MT855. Now I'll leave you with a John Deere example. This 2013 uh, Deere 9560 RT, 1,107 hours on it, very good condition, sold on a farm auction April 9th up in East Central North Dakota. Went for $206,000 highest auction price in two and a half years on a 9560 RT. Coming up, a celebration of music and wool. This isn't your typical festival. You have to see it to believe it. Next. It's an iconic idea. Grandma sitting in her rocking chair knitting. Well, this takes rocking and knitting to a whole new level. Welcome to Pearl Jam, and that's spelled P-U-R-L. Get it? Armed with needles and wool, teams of knitters from all over the world dance to the deafening sounds 
of heavy metal at the first ever heavy metal knitting world championship. Now it was held in eastern Finland. Competitors had names like Wolf Fumes, Bunny Bandit, and Nine Inch Needles. The goal? To showcase their knitting skills while dancing in the most unique way possible. I think it's great when you come out and as ridiculous as it is, everyone's behind you and enjoying themselves and everyone's cheering and getting into it and it's ridiculous but it's so much fun. Everyone should do this. <laughs> You're probably wondering who won this thing. It was a performance by a five person team featuring sumo wrestlers and a man dressed in a traditional Japanese kimono. The event was such a hit, organizers announced it will be back again next summer. There you have it. That's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. For all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a rockin' day.